Hello, and welcome to this US 275 Scientific Ethics Lecture on the Current Human Subject Regulations. And this is going to be a, a two-part uh, series of uh, videos. Uh, and then we'll basically start in with part one and come back for part two. So if you remember uh, on the last set of lectures, uh, we were talking about some of the kind of the atrocities, some of the kind of horrific conditions, uh, the un unethical experiments that were done kind of in the history um, of science and, and human research. Uh, now keep in mind that, you know, because this is an ethics class, I, I focused in on, you know, bad examples of individuals that were doing things in, in an unethical fashion. Uh, but keep in mind that there were, you know, a lot of doctors, a lot of scientists, you know, during this period of time that were doing good quality research uh, on human subjects uh, without the ethical concerns. But, you know, we're going to focus in on the problems so that we can better understand, you know, why we need to have uh, these guidelines and rules and laws uh, about human subject research. Uh, and uh, also to be able to really understand uh, the, the how these laws and how these guidelines uh, are there to protect the subjects and, and potentially, you know, areas they, were, they may need to be, you know, kind of supplemented or improved in some way. So uh, if you remember uh, from the last class, uh, one of the things we talked about were, you know, some of the atrocities that uh, occurred by Nazi scientists and Nazi uh, doctors during World War II. Uh, and so what happened is at the end of World War II, uh, after the liberation uh, of Germany, um, the, the forces went in and, and began to really see what had been occurring, uh, especially in relationship to the concentration camps. Uh, and, and people were really appalled. And so what they did is they, they held a military tribunal uh, referred to as the Nuremberg Trials, uh, in which uh, they brought the evidence that they found uh, against the, the, the scientists and the, the doctors uh, that were doing these unethical uh, experiments. And one of the things that came out of the Nuremberg trials uh, was the Nuremberg Code. Uh, and the Nuremberg Code uh, is going to be a set of standards that are used um, to try to kind of explain what is the kind of ideal or appropriate way uh, of doing research uh, in a way that's ethical, in a way that's kind of respectful uh, to the individuals uh, that are participating in the study, set in the study, uh, essentially the, the research subjects. And so if we take a look at the Nuremberg Code, uh, what we can see is, is basically all of the things that you know, went wrong uh, with the, the, the research, uh, the unethical research that was occurring in Germany uh, at that time. One of the key principles uh, of the Nuremberg Code uh, is this idea that uh, for a human or for an individual to uh, participate in a research study, uh, they've got to be able to voluntarily uh, consent to be a subject. Uh, they've got to be given the option as to whether or not they want to participate or if they want to, you know, pass on it and, and not be involved in the study. Uh, and so if we take a look at what this means, then uh, the individuals have to be able to freely give their consent. Uh, so they have to be able to decide on their own if they want to participate. Uh, in order to be able to decide on their own, uh, a couple things have to occur. They have to have the capacity to consent. Uh, so they have to be able to understand what is the study uh, that they're going to be involved in. And so uh, because of that, you know, you shouldn't be doing, or at least based on the Nuremberg Code, uh, you shouldn't be doing research on, you know, children uh, or individuals uh, with uh, mental challenges that, you know, have difficulty understanding and comprehending uh, what is going on uh, in these situations. Uh, they need to be informed uh, about what is going to be occurring within the study uh, so that they can have a, a really good understanding uh, about the advantages and disadvantages or, you know, potentially the, the benefits and the risks uh, of participating in the study. Uh, they need to be uh, free from coercion. Uh, and so, you know, when we're looking at the, the German research done on prisoners uh, in the concentration camps, you know, they, they didn't have that ability to, to give their free consent. They, you know, weren't, you know, free from coercion. You know, it may have been the situation where, you know, you will participate in the study, you know, regardless, or, you know, you will participate in the study and, you know, we'll actually feed you uh, as opposed to, you know, starving you like we're starving everybody else uh, within the concentration camp. Now, this concept of coercion uh, can extend to a lot of different areas as well. 
you know, if you've got an individual uh, that's impoverished, that doesn't have a job, that's trying to, you know, care for their family and support their family, uh, you went up to that person and said, okay, you know, participate in this really dangerous study, uh, but I'll give you 10000 or $20,000. That's a form of financial coercion. Uh, and it's basically kind of forcing an individual uh, in kind of a, a vulnerable position, in this case, a, an economically vulnerable position, uh, and coercing them to do something that they may not necessarily do. Uh, and the final uh, thing associated with the voluntary consent uh, of, the, of the subject uh, associated with the Nuremberg Code uh, is that the subject has to have the ability to freely withdraw uh, at any time. So it may be a situation where, you know, they're, they're participating in the study, you know, they gave their voluntary consent, they learned about the risks and the benefits, but you know, going forward, you know, it's just, you know, it's too much of a pain, you know, it's, you know, they're taking the medication and it's not, you know, making them feel better. Uh, it's potentially, you know, giving them problems. Uh, they don't want to go uh, and be tested over and over again. Uh, they don't want to commit the time, or maybe they just change their mind. I, you know, they don't have to give a reason, but they have to be able to freely withdraw from the study at any time. And as you can see, if you're doing this on subjects that are, you know, prisoners or uh, have uh, vulnerable populations because they, you know, they don't understand what's going on or they don't have autonomy over their actions, you can see that this can be violated uh, very easily. And this is what happened uh, in Nazi Germany as, as well as some of the other uh, situations we talked about in the last class. Now, following up on uh, the Nuremberg Code was the Declaration of Helsinki, you know, about 15, 20 years later. Uh, with the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, what we're looking at is uh, delegates from the World Medical Association, which you know, kind of represents the, the different national medical associations around the world, kind of coming together, um, really kind of adopting uh, and expanding upon uh, the Nuremberg Code principles um, and providing you know, key guidance on uh, what medical doctors and especially human clinical research uh, should be uh, looked at and how it should be done. Um, again, like the Nuremberg Code, which is you know, basically a set of guidelines and principles, the Declaration of Helsinki wasn't a, a binding international law. Uh, it was you know, a, uh, an association of, of medical groups kind of coming together, kind of establishing what you can think about as being kind of best practices. Uh, in medical research and medical treatment uh, and coming up with kind of expanded, more detailed uh, guidelines. Um, now, even though it's not uh, a binding international law that everybody has to follow, uh, the Declaration of Helsinki uh, served as a, a key starting point for many of the national laws uh, and regulations uh, throughout the world. Uh, the original Declaration of Helsinki uh, was agreed in 1964. Uh, after, you know, again, the delegates had, had worked on this and you know, come up with, you know, good, solid principles that everybody could agree with. Uh, but it's been revised uh, a number of times uh, over the years, uh, again, uh, in response to, you know, kind of changing technologies and addressing, you know, potential weaknesses uh, in the, uh, the guidelines that were there uh, as well. Uh, one thing that the Declaration of Helsinki does uh, is uh, helps distinguish between medical treatment uh, and medical research. Uh, so, you know, it's possible for a doctor to, you know, give a medication to uh, a patient. Um, it may be kind of off-label, you know, off-label means, you know, using a medication in a way that's not approved for, uh, but a lot of times there's evidence that it may be, you know, helpful, uh, maybe may not be kind of enough to get it approved by the FDA, uh, but there may be a benefit for that, you know, especially kind of patients that are end of life or uh, at a situation where they have a, a disease that really can't be treated with what uh, is available out there. Uh, and so they, you know, will try uh, an additional treatment that's not approved. Now, individual uh, treatment or treatment of individual patients uh, is kind of an expansion of medical treatment, medical practice, uh, and that's different from medical research. Medical research would be saying, you know, I want to study the medication for the treatment of this disease, uh, and so I'm going to set up a system. We're going to look at multiple patients. We're going to evaluate it. Uh, we're going to report on it. Um, 
and that, you know, in essence, is a form of medical research. And so there's a difference between research and the, the treatment uh, of a patient. And so uh, many cases, when we talk about these human subject regulations, what we're doing is really focusing in on the use of humans in uh, research situations. Now, moving into the United States, uh, again, the United States adopted the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, but as you remember uh, from our, our last set of lectures, you know, a lot of stuff was going on uh, in, the, in the 60s into uh, the early 70s. Uh, in the, the 1960s, uh, a lot of clinical research, uh, a lot of pharmaceutical research, a lot of other studies were done uh, on prisoners, uh, in many cases done uh, in sanitariums where you know, patients had limited capacity to be able to understand what was going on, uh, as well as uh, in 1972, um, the um, uh, Tuskegee uh, syphilis study uh, became more widely known uh, and publicized uh, within the papers. Uh, and so what we see is that uh, the United States began coming up with uh, very distinct uh, and very firm guidelines and rules uh, for uh, the protection of research subjects. Now, this began uh, in the mid-1960s uh, with the NIH. The NIH is the National Institute of Health, which uh, supports you know, most of the biomedical research uh, that occurs uh, within the United States. Uh, and it basically uh, was adopted and made a regulatory standard, which basically means it's the rule that has to be followed uh, in 1974. Um, this began within the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which, uh, as the government reorganized, uh, is now the Department of Health and Human Services, at least the Department of Health and Human Services, kind of oversees um, human research protections. Now, what we see, um, again, coming out of uh, this huge outcry uh, about the Tuskegee syphilis study, uh, about other things that had happened in the 60s, which you, you know, haven't gone into, but you, know, you can research uh, a lot of you know, private schools and sanitariums were doing research as well, and that, that was getting a lot of attention going into the 70s. Uh, they put together a commission to come up with kind of what are those rules that we have to enforce? What are those rules that, you know, in essence become laws uh, for how we need to humanely and ethically treat people uh, that are uh, participating uh, in research studies. And so uh, this was a four-year commission. Uh, so by about 1978, they issued uh, what's now referred to as uh, the Belmont uh, Report. And so the Belmont Report uh, establishes the guidelines uh, for human research uh, within the United States. And within the Belmont Report, uh, there's three uh, key principles, three basic ethical principles uh, for uh, all research uh, involving human subjects. And these can be described uh, in a very broad sense as uh, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And so we'll look at each one of these uh, in a little bit greater detail. So the first of these is respect for person. Uh, and so this means that, uh, again, we want to expand on that concept of uh, free consent uh, for an individual to participate in a research study. Uh, and so uh, what the Belmont Report does in the respect for persons is it uh, establishes the requirement for what's called informed consent. Uh, informed consent means that the individual understands what it is that they're volunteering for, what it is that is gonna be involved within the research study, and they have their own autonomy to make a decision as to whether or not uh, they want to become involved with the research. Uh, and so again, this is recognizing and respecting the personal dignity of, of individuals and recognizing their autonomy, that they have the ability to make the decision for themselves as to whether or not they wanna participate in this study. Now, this goes a little bit further uh, than what we'd seen uh, in either uh, the Helsinki or uh, the Nuremberg Code. Uh, because it provides special protection uh, with persons with diminished uh, autonomy. And again, what we're talking about with uh, diminished autonomy uh, is individuals that may not necessarily have the ability to make decisions on their own. Uh, and because of that, 
uh, they're an especially uh, vulnerable population and therefore need to be protected. Uh, and so this includes children. Um, so they, you know, children don't have the ability to understand completely what it is that is going to be involved with. You know, we don't allow them to sign contracts. Why are we going to allow them to, you know, agree to participate in studies? And so, you know, there are rules that, you know, if you do studies on children, you know, you have to you know, do informed consent with the parents and at a certain age, you know, you've got to be able to explain it to the children uh, in a way that they can understand as opposed to, you know, scientific jargon and lots of big words. You've got to really explain to the child what is, the, what is going to be going on. Special um, provisions for vulnerable both patients uh, with mental illnesses, uh, again, coming out of a lot of the work uh, in the 50s and 60s in, in sanitariums, uh, where they basically, you know, put uh, patients with uh, mental illnesses and, and basically kind of locked them up and left them there. Uh, but, you know, it was a population that, you know, like prisoners, you know, prisoners of the criminal justice system, uh, it was a population that was uh, especially vulnerable, but uh, at least prior to this time, had been used as a, a, a sample of, uh, of convenience, because it was convenient to go in and get a lot of, of people uh, participating in the study relatively quickly. And so uh, the Belmont report said we need to have special provisions for these vulnerable populations. The second concept within uh, the Belmont report is beneficence. Uh, this beneficence is um, the, uh, the ability to respect that uh, an individual has to be able to understand what's going on and make uh, uh, advantages versus disadvantages, uh, risk versus benefit analysis. Um, and they need to be able to understand that, and the researcher needs to be able to understand that. And so the researcher needs to design the study in a way uh, that they're going to maximize the benefits uh, of the research and minimize the risk. Uh, and so they're, in, effen in essence, trying to protect the persons from harm by maximizing the anticipated benefits, minimizing the possible risks of harm, and, and again, Pro trying really hard uh, to come up with a way that you know you're going to be able to do the study uh, with uh, the least amount of impact on the individual uh, as well. The final uh, concept within the uh, the uh, Belmont report, you know, we said the first uh, was respect for persons. The second was beneficence. Uh, the last one uh, is justice. Uh, what we're looking at with this concept of justice is that the benefits and burdens of research should be fairly distributed. Uh, and so if we're taking a look at this, you know, we shouldn't always do research on, you know, one group of individuals. Uh, we need to be able to, to do it on kind of a broad set of individuals uh, and especially uh, to kind of spread it out. And so this is, you know, good science because you want to be able to understand how whatever it is you're studying, you know, affects kind of a diverse population of individuals, you know, because we can see, you know, you know, an illness goes around, some people get really sick, some people you know, get a little bit sick, and some people don't get sick at all. Uh, you need to be able to understand why people have different responses uh, to different aspects of, of medicine. Uh, and so what we need to do uh, is take a look at both individual justice uh, and social justice. Uh, so the individual justice is to not offer potentially beneficial research to preferred subjects. And so you don't, you know, go into a doctor's office and you're the doctor's favorite patient and they say, okay, uh, I'm going to put you in the good test group uh, that's going to get the good drugs and get a good benefit out of it. Uh, where somebody else comes in and they're, you know, a pain and, you know, they're difficult to work with. And so we're going to put them in the, uh, the risky category. Uh, because they're, they're kind of undesirable and, you know, we're not happy with them and we're, you know, going to, you know, take it out with them uh, by, by acting in that way. The other thing uh, to keep in mind is that we need to focus in on social justice as well. Um, you don't want to use the situation, and I, I use this as an example of coercion uh, a few slides ago. Um, in many cases, people that participate in human research studies receive a, a small stipend to you know, cover their, their expenses and their time to participate in it. Um, but you've got some individuals that you know, make a living out of participating uh, in, in research groups. Uh, and so you, you run the risks then 
that uh, individuals uh, in an impoverished situation uh, that need to find you know income in some way uh, are going to become involved in you know kind of risky or, or painful uh, biomedical research studies uh, where you know there's some benefit to them they're getting a you know financial reward the scientist is learning more uh, but you know it's an un unfair burden onto the population that's serving as research subjects and you know you may be developing something that you know the the rich suburban um, patients are, are going to benefit from even though they're not involved uh, with the studies uh, and so it's important that when we're setting up these studies, you know, we're getting a diverse group of, of individuals participating in it, and we're not, you know, selectively going after vulnerable populations. Vulnerable populations as def defined in uh, the respect for persons, like the children, the patients for mental illness and prisoners, but also kind of respecting, you know, individuals that may, you know, be exposed to some level of coercion, you know, just by participating in the studies and, and receiving an income or, or a stipend uh, associated with that. So, and, and again, like the Helsinki uh, Accord, uh, the Belmont Report uh, defined uh, in very explicit terms the boundaries between clinical treatment, essentially medical practice, treating a, a patient, uh, and clinical research. And so clinical therapy or clinical th treatment uh, can be thought about as standard of care. And so that's basically, you know, the doctor, you know, working individually with a patient to determine, you know, what is the, the best type of treatment for that patient at that period of time based on their conditions. And sometimes that will involve using a drug off label, using a drug in a slightly different way uh, than what it's approved for within the FDA. Um, but it's not research. It's, it's treating that patient with what is expected to be the best thing for that patient. In contrast, uh, clinical research uh, is this idea that we're going to be setting up uh, very specific protocols or very specific studies that we're going to go through and try to determine whether or not this drug treatment or this uh, intervention uh, is beneficial uh, in some way. Now, sometimes this will occur simultaneously, and so, you know, we may be, you know, treating a patient uh, with a, a drug off-label uh, in a way uh, that we're also doing clinical research, um, but we need to keep in mind that, you know, if we are doing research, we've got to make sure uh, that it's being done uh, ethically. Uh, and so if we take a look at this, again, the clinical practice, again, beating this up a little bit, but I want to really emphasize it, uh, especially, you know, at this day and age when we're, we're talking so much about clinical trials and, you know, people are looking for various treatments and, and new treatments that aren't approved uh, for diseases going around. Uh, so clinical practice is, is basically therapeutic practice. Uh, this is a doctor working individually with their patient uh, to enhance uh, their well-being. Uh, and so they're going to be using interventions with a reasonable expectation of success. And so they're going to be making a decision based on the patient in a way that they're going to try to maximize the benefit for that patient and not necessarily try to you know, generate knowledge that they're going to be uh, presenting to others or using to kind of justify using this treatment another way. And so uh, the purposes of clinical practice are to provide a diagnosis, to you know, kind of assess the patient, figure out you know, how they are, you know, what condition they have, uh, what needs to be done to treat them, potentially preventative treatments. Uh, so you know, treating them in a way that you know, minimizes the progression of a disease or the development of a disease. Uh, and finally, therapy of particular individuals. And so treatment of uh, a disease or a condition um, that the patient has. In contrast, uh, the research uh, is going to be uh, an experimental design, an experimental study uh, that's going to be set up to a test hypothesis. And the hypothesis is, does this drug or does this treatment uh, improve the outcome of you know, a disease? Does it do something that uh, is beneficial and better 
uh, than what out what is out there uh, already. Uh, and so it's set up. It's going to have controls. It's going to have different groups, uh, different concentrations. Uh, and the idea is that with these formal protocols and procedures, uh, they're going to go through and in a very systematic way determine whether or not uh, this is something that is beneficial uh, for a broader population of individuals. And so research is, is what's needed to get FDA approval uh, for the drug to be used for a new treatment. Uh, it, it's also what's needed to occur uh, if you're going to be developing a new drug. You've got to do very extensive uh, clinical research to show that it's safe and effective and doesn't cause problems uh, over a long period of time. Now, more recently, um, the uh, federal government has adopted what's referred to uh, as a common rule. Uh, and so this was uh, originally uh, put in place in the early 1990s uh, and has been updated again uh, a number of times. Uh, and this basically kind of works from uh, the principles established within the Belmont Report uh, and applies it very specifically with very specific guidelines, very specific rules uh, on what's allowed and what's not allowed and guidelines for how things are going to be kind of approved and how things are going to be you know, maintained in an ethical fashion. Uh, and the common rule uh, applies uh, pretty much throughout the entire government, uh, as well as um, the uh, institutions or scientists uh, that are working with support uh, of these government agencies. Uh, and so the common rule applies to, you know, pretty much um, all of the government agencies, the National Science Foundation, NASA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, and so we'll take a look a little bit about that um, coming up. Um, but the Food and Drug Administration has some variations of the common rule, uh, as well as some modifications of that. You know, the Food and Drug Administration has slightly different regulations uh, because their rules are, are a little bit different. Uh, their kind of goals are a little bit different than some of these other agencies. So if we take a look at the Food and Drug Administration, if I find my mouse, uh, what we're looking at is uh, some things that are, are in common uh, so the Institutional Review Board, which I haven't defined, informed consent, which we did talk about uh, within the Belmont Report. Uh, so these are, are going to be common, you know, within the common rule, uh, as well as within the FDA. Uh, but uh, the differences uh, are uh, what's applicable. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has uh, specific rules for FDA regulated products. So things like drugs, uh, devices. Uh, so a device would be uh, like a heart valve. Uh, so if you're going to test a heart valve, they're going to have specific rules that go along with that. Biologics are, you know, kind of uh, proteins that can be isolated or serum that can be isolated uh, that can be used uh, in the treatment of, of disease. And so uh, pretty much very, very similar guidelines, but uh, a little bit more explicit, a little bit more uh, detailed uh, when we take a look at uh, the Food and Drug Administration requirements. And so that finishes up uh, this first half uh, of the lecture. Uh, come back for part two, where I'll explain what an international or institutional review board is, uh, as well as give you a little bit more insight into what are these rules uh, that scientists and doctors uh, need to follow if they're going to be doing human subject research. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you and have a great day.